Thanks, doll. See you after the video. <laughs> oh, hello there. The name's Strecker. James Strecker. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Uh, after all, this is a video about all the James Bond references in the DC animated universe. Yes, those Batman cartoons from the 90s, pretty slick stuff. The staff behind those wonderful shows really liked to throw in any reference they could to, well, uh, pretty much anything except DC Comics. Spider-Man stuff, Fantastic Four stuff, Star Wars stuff, we should probably do a video about that one someday. But among these tips of their proverbial lady hats, Bruce Tim and company couldn't help but occasionally toss in a sly nod to good old 007 in nearly every one of their shows. Batman and Bond have had a lengthy history together. Though James Bond was created 14 years after Bruce Wayne, their storied adventures in literature eventually brought them both to motion pictures, where they became two of the most well-known and fondly remembered pop culture icons of the 1960s and 70s. Batman actor Adam West was even in the running to play Mr. Bond, but turned down the role, which he believed should remain portrayed by British actors. Though this didn't stop West from appearing in several Nestle Quick ads as an obvious Bond knockoff. Toodaloo. And the DC connections, however loose, continue to this day, with Timothy Dalton appearing in a starring role in the Doom Patrol series, or Die Another Day Bond girl Halle Berry's critically panned portrayal of Catwoman in Catwoman. Oh, and Pierce Brosnan is set to appear as Dr. Fate in the upcoming Black Adam movie. But I promise you, the DC animated Bond references go even deeper. And no, not just because Bruce Tim and James Bond have an affinity for the sexy ladies. While we could go through all these references chronologically one by one, I think it's only fair to you, the likely millennial and or Gen Z viewer, to gather them all together to be sorted by, well, for lack of a more elegant term, categories of stuff that is similar to to other stuff. And to help me out here today is fellow DCAU content creator and James Bond enthusiast, Chris Lord of the Tim Talk podcast. You thought this was a martini glass? <laughs> Actually, it's a two-way radio. Chris? Chris, are you there? Oh, that's right. This is my kitchen and there's no such thing as a walkie-talkie martini. Or if there was, at least I couldn't afford it. I'm not wearing pants right now. Showtime, everybody! Uh-huh. Engagement. They can talk all they like. That means everything. Don't forget that. You heard it, folks! Throughout the development of the DC Animated Universe, the James Bond films have provided inspiration for a number of general traits and aesthetics. General traits and aesthetics. Batman himself, throughout these series, is a very similar character to Bond in many ways. He has an armored car full of whiz-bangs and colorful weaponry. He has a glove compartment where he hides his costume. His person is, at all times, decked out with hidden gadgets. Lucius Fox and Alfred provide sort of Q-like presences, designing and upgrading his gear on a regular basis. He has a running and expanding gallery of household name rogues. And though this is more of a recent addition to the James Bond mythos, Batman is the textbook traumatic past anchor in fiction, with deceased parents and psychological motivations that drive him to do good, much like where Daniel Craig has taken the Bond character of late. But even past these surface level comparisons, the crew behind the DCAU shows have never shied away from their blatant Bond influences. For example, in his Modern Masters feature, Bruce Timm referred to the Batman Beyond Return of the Joker movie as having a James Bond style pre-title sequence, comparing the extremely action-heavy opening scene to the likes of the Bond films as similar hit you over the head, hey, pay attention, this is gonna be a cool movie, tactic. Composer Lolita Ritmanis described her soundtrack for Batman Mystery of the Batwoman as having a very purposely James Bond vibe. Smooth, mystery solving, sexy, cool. And even as recently as 2020's first volume of Batman The Adventures Continue, Writers Alan Burnett and Paul Dini, formerly of Batman the Animated Series, couldn't help but include a line from Robin Tim Drake asking about going to see a James Bond movie that's currently playing in theaters. Which James Bond movie this is actually referring to, we may never know, since the timeline of that comic is… well… That's a topic for another day. But beyond all that, there truly are literal, hey, this thing is a James Bond thing, things. So I finally give the floor to Mr. Lord. Ah, well, hello there. My name's Lord. Chris Lord. I already did that joke. Oh, 
Um, okay. In that case, well, hello, my name is Pussy Galord. The world of James Bond is one of the most iconic in all of cinema, filled with unique characters, locations, and imagery. So it's no real surprise that Bruce, Tim, and co. would have drawn heavily from that world when building out the DCAU. In Batman Mask of the Phantasm, Carl Beaumont is drawn to look like Bond's own father-in-law, Mark andre Draco, played by Gabrielle Frizzetti in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. And the jetpack the Joker attempts to escape on is modeled off the jetpack used in the cold open of Thunderball. That jetpack was actually a real thing, crazy enough. Don't know if it would have fit into the boot of an Aston Martin though. See, it's not, not really very big. In the Justice League Unlimited episode, I Am Legion, a countdown timer stops at seven seconds, likely a nod to Goldfinger when a nuclear bomb stops at 007 seconds detonation. The Batman the Animated Series episode, The Cat and the Claw, is basically one big reference to James Bond. Not only is the British Secret Service, aka MI6, referenced, but all of the agents, M1, M2, M3, are an obvious nod to the double O's of Bond's MI6. The whole episode episode, in fact, plays out like one classic Bond film with a massive global threat and a big globe-trotting adventure. And it's not the only one. Other episodes, like The Cat in the Claw, Demon's Quest, and Maid of Honor have very serious Bond vibes. Batman, Batman, Batman. That's all we ever talk about. <laughs> it's always Batman! You want more Superman, Static, whatever that one was with the robot. Well, here's some non-Batman stuff. The Superman the Animated Series episode, Where There's Smoke, is one of the DCAU's more Bond-heavy episodes. This story sees Superman face off against government experiment turned supervillain Volcana, and ends on a remote beach where Volcana is shown wearing a white bikini, which, due to her location, fans have speculated over the years may be in reference to the one worn by Honey Rider, played by Ursula Andress in the first James Bond film, Dr. No. But another reason this may be more than just generic swimwear is due to a couple other bigger Bond connections in this episode. That of the radiation suits worn by agents of Project Firestorm, bearing a striking resemblance to those worn in Dr. No's very own lab, and the episode's main villain, Kurt, is honest to God drawn to resemble Bond actor George Lazenby, as confirmed in our interviews with director Dan Reba. But that isn't the only time George Lazenby was attached to the DCAU. Oh, George Lazenby. As the only one and done Bond actor, his name has basically become synonymous with the acting equivalent of a one hit wonder. But the reason people still talk about him really isn't from his lack of movies, but actually from the exceptional quality of his one film on Her Majesty's Secret Service, often overlooked by casual fans, primarily because of Lazenby and also because it was critically panned at the time of release. Now it is considered by the Bond fan community to be one of the greatest Bond films of all time. So what makes on Her Majesty's Secret Service so special. Essentially, it took Bond from the over-the-top, outer space-faring adventures of You Only Live Twice and brought it back to its more grounded roots. It hues very close to the original novel and really focuses on Bond as a lone man on a mission. And this time, it's personal. Not only is Bond on the heels of head of Spectre, Ernst Stavro Blofeld, but along the way he falls in love with and marries Countess Tracy Di Vincenzo, considered by many to be one of the greatest Bond women of all time. It was an experiment in many ways, focusing less on villainous plot, gadgets, and spectacle, and more on heart, romance, and even a genuine character arc for Bond. It really was the Casino Royale of its day, though without the flawless execution and universal praise. It was only through decades of support from diehard Bond fans that the film was able to get first cult status and then critical reappraisal and eventually widely acknowledged love. The legacy of the film, in fact, lives on in a number of references in the latest Bond outing, No Time to Die. So we've talked at length about the film itself, but what does it have to do with the DCAU? Well, a lot in fact. The most notable reference is the casting of George Lazenby himself as King, the head of the Royal Flush Gang in the series Batman Beyond. In his debut episode, he says the line, we have all the time in the world. We have all the time in the world. Itself a prominent line of dialogue from On Her Majesty's Secret Service. We have all the time in the world. 
and the name of the theme song sung by Louis Armstrong from that film. And interestingly, Lazenby already had an existing history with the DC Comics world, having played Jor-El in a couple episodes of the TV series Superboy. Continuing the Superman connection, the DCAU version of Lex Luthor is modeled off of actor Telly Savalas, who played Blofeld in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, and voice actor Clancy Brown even brings a little bit of Savalas into his performance as Lex. I have assembled all the relevant documents, title deeds, certificates of birth and death. They'll be sent to your room for authentication. <laughs> what makes you think you can kill Superman when you can't even handle a mere mortal in a Halloween costume? Dan Reba has even said that On Her Majesty's Secret Service was a favorite Bond film amongst the DCAU crew. On Her Majesty's Secret Service is like one of our mm -hmm. favorite James Bond films. It's really fabulous. See? He said it. So it's no surprise that that film was a huge influence on the DCAU and so many references come from just that film alone. I really wanted to talk about that Telly Savalas Lex Luthor thing, but it fit better in Chris's section, I guess. So instead, I suppose I'll talk about the Justice League episode Maid of Honor, but I'm not really too bummed about it. This is one of my favorite episodes of the series, and no, not just because there's Wonder Bat, and it has the bat wing in it, and it introduces Vandal Savage's immortality origin story. It's because there's James Bond stuff too. Espionage, underground lairs, Blofeld suits. There's no way Vandal Savage's look was not based on Blofeld. Look at that name. Nehru collar. That's called a Nehru collar, apparently. According to Dan Reba, the bad guy plot involving a railgun was inspired by the diamond laser satellite in Diamonds Are Forever. Though I wouldn't be surprised if there's a teeny bit of Moonraker in there too, since that's that's the space one where they're in astronaut suits and stuff. Though the launch sequence music composed by Christopher Carter is actually inspired by the space scenes from You Only Live Twice, according to Dan, who also says he thinks the musical score for this episode overall is so James Bond. Our star henchman, Colonel Vox, also feels like he walked right out of a Bond movie, being this sort of muscle with a physical ailment, much like the character of Jaws, who appears in several 007 films. This episode even has this line. Wayne. Bruce Wayne. Like, come on! It's clear the folks behind the DCAU had an unbridled love for the world of James Bond, a handful of movies in particular. But for our last segment here, let's take a look at some of the crossovers between the voices of DC and the faces of JB. J James Bond. I roll with it. Renowned actor John Rhys Davies of Lord of the Rings and Indiana Jones fame played General Pushkin in The Living Daylights, while also lending his voice to Hades in Justice League's Paradise Lost, Baron Wakla Yosik in the BTAS episode The Cape and Cowl Conspiracy, and Albino, otherwise known as Edgar Mandragora, the adult version of that little kid from JLU who now has psychic superpowers, in Rose Gift, an episode of that robot show, whatever that one was. Robert Davi, who voiced Magma, one of the true trio in the Batman Beyond episode Heroes also played the iguana-toting villain Franz Sanchez in License to Kill. Plus, you might recognize him as one of the FBI agents Big Johnson in Die Hard. Vincent Schiavelli portrayed Dr. Kaufman in Tomorrow Never Dies, but also lent his vocal cords to John Zatara, father of Zatanna, in the BTAS episode Zatanna. For Goldeneye, Pierce Brosnan's first outing as James Bond, actress Cella Ward, famous for her roles in The Fugitive, TV's Once and Again, and House MD, auditioned to play the lead Bond woman, but she was deemed too old at 39 years old, which, mind you, is only two years younger than star Pierce Brosnan, but apparently 10 years too old to play his love interest. She would then go on to voice Paige Monroe, aka Calendar Girl, in the new Batman Adventures episode Mean Seasons. It's a commentary on the entertainment industry's obsession with youth and beauty. And perhaps the loosest voice actor connection of them all, the View to a Kill antagonist Max Zorin was played by none other than Christopher Walken, who did appear in Batman Returns, which inspired Batman the Animated Series, and like Michael Rosenbaum was doing a Christopher Walken impression when he voiced Ghoul in Return of the Joker in JLU. What we're after is cutting edge. That one, that's, uh, that's close enough, right? 
So, that's it, I think. I'm glad we got to do this one to time with the release of No Time to Die. I definitely didn't postpone this video about six different times or anything like that. But did we miss anything? Is there some blatant James Bond reference in the DCAU that you have noticed over the years that we didn't include? Maybe we're just that stupid and there's some Static Shock episode where, like, Goldfinger comes in to order a burger at Burger Fool. Leave us a comment below and let us know. Oh, this really is just olive water. Thank you so much to Chris Lord for coming on the channel. Not only because it meant I only had to make like two thirds of this video myself, I seriously didn't even know half the stuff on our list here before we started working on the script. And my name is James. This video would not have been possible without Chris. While our lovely Patreon supporters names, let me just get that out of there, scroll by, here he is again to tell you all about the Tim Talk podcast and wherever else you can find him. Thanks James. As you mentioned, I am the co-host of Tim Talk, named after the patron saint of the DCAU, Bruce Tim. On that show, my co-host Cameron and I have gone through and rewatched every movie and TV episode of the DCAU, yes, including The Zeta Project, plus a bevy of bonus episodes on major film releases, year-end specials, and whatever the hell we feel like talking about. We're currently watching season two of Justice League Unlimited, which means that we're gonna be wrapping up the whole universe in the coming months. But you can find the show wherever you get your podcasts, including on the Pond Tower YouTube channel. And you can reach us at Tim Talk Pond on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Gmail. You can find me personally at Lordofer, that's L-O-R-D-O-P-H-E-R, -E some weird amalgamation of my first and last name, on Instagram. And then while you're at it, go check out the podcast that I produce for work called X-Ray Vision. It's Crooked Media's new podcast from Jason Concepcion, formerly of the Binge Mode podcast. And it's a weekly deep dive on the most zeitgeist-defining TV, film, and comics every single week. And we just recently covered the most recent Bond film, No Time to Die, on an episode. So go check that out. I say again, go subscribe to the Pod Tower YouTube channel. Not only is every episode of Tim Talk over there new and old, but brand new episodes of our newest podcast, Jump on the Batwagon, where I'm showing my friend Brian the entire DC animated universe. He has never seen any of it. Well, technically now he's seen 10, 11, 12, something like that episodes, but you, you understand, okay? I know you do. We're just a couple of yappy dudes over there. If you don't get that rip snorter of a joke, then you really have to listen to the podcast. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next every whatever reference in the DCAU video. Star Wars? Wait, there's a lot of Star Trek stuff in there too. Which one should I do first?